On January 12th, 2010, the country of Haiti, the island nation of the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, was devastated with a 7.0 earthquake. It was shocking. I just remember tears in my eyes as I was watching that on CNN. And over that night, I began to think about what I could do and what we could do as a class in social innovation. And I began to wonder, what is the purpose of a university in a situation like that? What's the role of a business school like the Marriott School of Management when there's a huge human disaster and immense suffering? And so I came to class the next day and said, you all saw the devastation overnight. 300,000 people dead, 100,000 more injured, a million people homeless, the government's buildings just pancaked to the ground. Uh, the cries, you could hear the cries of children and victims in the rubble. And I said to the class, anybody want to start a project with me to do that? Within the first couple of days, we started formatting how we might work this, and we listed out what are some of the big challenges to going to Haiti and doing something like this to implement our plans next summer. And so we came up with a, a list of, well, we need to understand the culture of Haiti and some of the language. We need to find partners we can work with so that whatever we start will succeed after we've come back to school, after the summer's over. We want to have this continuously rolling out and having some impacts. Uh, we start focusing on such things as where should we work? How do we get there? What are the logistics travel plans? How do we raise money? What sort of PR effort is this going to take? And, and as we began those explorations and different students volunteered for these different task forces or teams, all of a sudden we started finding help. We started having Haitians come to some of our meetings. We started meeting at night after the university courses of the day were shut down. We started planning longer term. We started having debates and arguments among ourselves in terms of what should we do first? What do they need? How do we know? We don't want to go in and lay our solutions on them. We want instead to list, listen and understand and learn from them. And uh, in the process, come up with some sort of partnership strategy where they feel they have a voice in this. We feel we have a voice. We don't promise a whole lot. We start with small steps, baby steps, and I propose that we create a climate of experimentation instead of saying, okay, let's do this big thing. Here's our strategy. Let's go roll it out down there. We've got all the papers written. We've got all the documents signed. We've got all the I's dotted and the T's crossed. Now let's just go do our thing for them, which is kind of a top down, you know, we have the answers. You poor people don't have the answers. We wanted to avoid that. So I was arguing we create a climate of experimentation and agree to, here's a rough outline of how we're going to proceed, but let's learn as we go. Let's develop new insights uh, above and beyond theory and methods we have as we start implementing this down there in that beautiful island. And let's figure out if this works, great. And if this piece of it doesn't, let's toss that and go on to the next one. And little by little, learning by doing, action research is what we call it sometimes, we'll figure out how to make this effective for and in behalf of the Haitians. Not us, not our classes, BYU, not our grades, not our careers, not our big money, but for and in behalf of those folks. So that's how we organize this thing.
I was very fortunate to have some outstanding MBA students and other students. We had one was a local Haitian who'd lived here for a couple years, going to school, but grew up near Leogan. So he knew the area, he knew the culture, he knew the way around. Because one of our biggest challenge was Creole. We didn't know anything of the Creole language. So we started having Haitians come to our training sessions, teaching us a few phrases, a few words. We got some French-speaking volunteers to join us. We had a Mongolian MBA student who was our executive director. He'd had some great management experience in the U.S. and, and in Japan. He became our overall leader. And then we had a U.S. team manager and a Haitian team manager in country. And then under them, or in partnership with them, we had experts on such services we were going to provide as microfinance, the giving of small loans, and microenterprise training to poor villagers. That was one of our efforts. Another one was what we called square foot gardening, which was agricultural expertise to help poor families in Haiti learn how to triple their production on a little plot of ground to provide more food and better nutrition for themselves because the supermarkets were destroyed. You know, there were just little street markets in neighborhoods so, so they could grow their own produce and have enough of it to be healthy themselves and produce enough to be able to sell some of that in the local market. And so those became little income generating projects. Then we also spent a lot of energy and planning around health care, training for emergency services, uh, training for emergency injuries, cuts, bruises, breaks, how to get people out of harm's way, uh, how to avoid AIDS, HIV, AIDS, how to deal with cholera, which started to become an epidemic there that summer. We also had a lot of volunteers work in orphanages, uh, institutions, help children teach and care for and amplify the staff of the orphanages where they'd lost members in the destruction. We helped build some new orphanages, repair some old ones, put in clean water systems in some of those orphanages and some of those villages that hadn't had anything before. So pure water was another big thrust of our, of our effort there. And little by little, all of these services began to start to have an impact. And people began to say, wow, these, these folks are here. They're not just crazy American students come down to party and drink and, and uh, take their drugs and dance every night. We worked six days a week, from dawn to dusk. We were up teaching English to 300 Haitians by 6 o'clock, 6.30 every morning, depending on the class, depending on the area of, of, of uh, Leogan, where we were working. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a huge opportunity for those who didn't know how to grow gardens or know much about business and microfinance. Some of our volunteers, at least they could teach English except for the Californians who speak funny language. But, uh, but they, were, they were amazing in a class of 100 people who were showing up, mostly young people, but some in their 30s and 40s, saying, we want to learn English now because we're hoping after this destruction, Europe and the US will put factories in here. They'll want to hire English speakers, and we can gain those jobs. You know, one of the most impressive experiences of the time I spent in Haiti that summer was the first day. My colleagues and I, my students and I, we'd flown across the country, overnighted in Miami, then took, took into, off to Haiti in the next morning. And by the time we got there, it was later in the afternoon, 
We had a friend who helped orphanages there, a wonderful woman from uh, Utah, who'd been living in Haiti for 10 years or so. She'd adopted a few Haitian children, and she worked with other orphanages in the area. And she said, Warner, when you arrive, we want to pick you up and take you to my place, to our facility, to spend that first night before you have to go to Laogon. It's going to be too dark and dangerous. So she came with her driver and picked up five or six of us in a pickup. We tossed the luggage in back. We climbed in back. And they started driving off through the total chaos from the airport to Port-au-Prince. There were just mounds of rock all over the place, walls down, buildings totally wide open that had, that had been destroyed. S structures you know, that were five or six stories high were now about a story high. And the streets were torn to shreds. There was water in lots of places because there's a low uh, water table in that area. None of the bridges were operational. So you'd go, you'd drive up by the bridge that used to be there and then drive down into the dirt and try to get across the creek or the water and come up the other side. Meanwhile, people are rushing at you wanting money, wanting help, wanting prayers. And it was just crazy. That 10 minute drive that is normally required from the airport to Port-au-Prince took us an hour. We get into Port-au-Prince and, and Rebecca, our friend, says, let's go stop at this place just on the way to my operation. I want to introduce you to the damage and the hope for Haiti. And we drove up along this cobblestone street Stop. There was a huge wall there, a big uh, rock wall, 20 feet high. No windows, but there was a tiny little door entrance, a metal door. And she knocked on the door, and a guard came and opened the little window and said, Who are you? What do you want? She said, I'm Rebecca. I'm here with Professor Woodworth to visit your facilities. And she'd arranged that and ahead of time. We went in. And I looked out, all there was is jungle. And then I saw there were rock stairs going up behind that wall, just inside that wall. 20, 20 stairs or so. So we walked up these stairs, and I'm saying, where's the orphanage? This was going to be an orphanage. And I said, where, where is the orphanage? What is this place? She said, this is Mother Teresa's orphanage for poor and abandoned and malnutrition children. I said, oh, wow, that's, what a privilege. I'm expecting to see the orphanage at the top of the stairs, and I get up there, there's just a cement slab and a huge tent. And I say, wasn't there a building here? She said, yes, the orphanage was completely destroyed. So we brought in a little bulldozer and pushed all the rubble off the cement pad that was about 50 yards long, pushed it down into the jungle, and then had two tents from the UN and the Red Cross. They were huge tents, 20, 30 feet wide, 75 or more feet long. And she said, let's go in. I walk in there, and here are cribs on both sides of the tent walls, one against another, a narrow path in the middle for us to walk through, and one little faint electric light bulb hanging from a wire at one end of the tent and one at the other. And in every one of those tiny cribs, there was a tiny child or a baby. And many were crying. They were all mal malnourished. Their skinny little bodies. I said, Rebecca, let's hold some of them. Let's cheer them up. She said, no, we can't do that yet. And so we kept walking. I thought, wow, I've never seen so many babies. I, I have adopted a child from an orphanage in Brazil that lived in a facility something like that, but I'd never seen anything like this, and I wanted to hug those babies. We walk out the end of that tent, and I said, wow, that was, wait, what? I look ahead, and here's another tent. 
the same thing, the same size, the same structure, chuck full of cribs and little toddlers and, and babies in that other facility there. And it was just, I, my heart ached, my tears came to my eyes, and I say, Rebecca, we want to love these babies, we want to kiss these babies, we want to hold them, we want to sing to them. And so the nuns brought out some of those little children. And here we were, these big, gruff bunch of Americans. One was a star football player in Arizona. One was a manager, worked for a big firm here in Provo, Utah. And uh, all of a sudden, we're holding these tiny little, sweet, precious, black babies of Haiti. Those who survived, who'd lost parents, who'd lost siblings, who had been abandoned because their families couldn't take care of them. And so we had a very, I want to say a sacred experience, a special experience there, just talking to them in our own language, hugging them, dancing a little with some of them, uh, praying for them, tickling them, laughing with them. The nuns thought we were crazy, but they said, this is what our babies need some human care, some human contact, some nurturing. And uh, I felt like I could stay there all night. Finally they said, okay, you can't now. We've, we've got to feed these babies and you folks have got to go. I said, okay, we'll, we'll leave. And they said, wait, wait, don't, don't do it yet. Get ready to go. Get your cameras and get everything ready. And when you're absolutely ready to walk out of this tent and out of this orphanage, you tell us and hand us the babies because immediately they're going to all start screaming and crying and holding their arms out for you and, and we need to get them under control. So we got all ready and we took off and they started wailing and it was a sad, sad experience. I felt guilty. I felt the pain that God must feel when he sees his children hungry or suffering. And uh, I vowed we're going to help this country like I was never motivated before. So, out of this Sustain Haiti experience, I concluded a couple things that may be of interest to you. One is, we can't do everything. We can't solve all of the world's problems. But we can each do one thing. We can give a little time, a little energy, a little money. We can learn about a culture and figure out ways to strengthen that culture and in to improve the quality of life of those people. And we're just a bunch of college students at an average university here in the U.S. But we found out we could do something, and maybe it's not on the scale or the scope or the size of that done by the U.N. or United Way or the Red Cross or General Motors, but we can do some fairly successful things. We can build relationships. We can help increase the capacity of people in Haiti. And it doesn't take 20 years of studies. It doesn't take a PhD. It doesn't take a military background. We can do some good work. And if we have this kind of climate of experimentation where we don't get too stuck on our solutions, but make them flexible and make them uh, open to change and improvement. The Japanese talk a lot about continuous improvement in organizations. That's basically what we did with Haiti. So here we are three years later, we've been sending volunteers, dozens of volunteers from BYU and, and colleges and universities around the, the Western US mostly, and every year building more success having greater impacts, succeeding at deeper change, and in the process, building love and understanding the kind of ideas that Martin Luther King talked about when he discussed his dream of building a beloved community. I feel like that's kind of what we're seeing roll out here in, in the relationship between Sustain Haiti and the people of Haiti. We now have a small little Haitian staff that works to continue our efforts 
while the majority of students come back, those who spent the, uh, the summer there in 2010, 2011, 2012, uh, they come back to their school, they come back to their careers, they go to, off to law school or whatever, uh, the med school, medical school. Meanwhile, they come with a passion as they realize they can really do something. They can really make an impact. And I think it's a life-changing experience for them that they're going to continue responding to crises like this the rest of their lives. And hopefully, in many cases, they will also do ongoing development so that someday there will be a little sustained Haiti in Dominican Republic or in Guatemala or in Zimbabwe. And these individuals will find out they don't need millions of dollars to make a difference.